Hello there, welcome to ITV News Central. On tonight's programme, tributes to the man who led Coventry City to one of the FA Cup's biggest shock wins. We remember John Sillitz, who's died aged 85. A very really sad day, especially in the life of Coventry City, losing a, a colossal of a man. Well, I'll be looking back at that incredible day from 1987 and be reminding ourselves of some of the great footballing wisdom John shared with us over the years. Also tonight, earn or learn, a Birmingham mother's dilemma over changes to universal credit. It's a choice between us stuck at home, doing nothing, or going on to college to learn about life skills. Commonwealth Games inspectors check up on whether everything's on track. And when rain bends the light of the sun through refraction, the bonus to us is rainbows. Will we be seeing any? Join me later and I'll let you know. Good evening. The man who led Coventry City to FA Cup glory in 1987 has died at the age of 85. John Sillett, who was affectionately known as Snoz, will forever have a place in the hearts of the club's fans after leading them to glory over a Tottenham team full of stars at Wembley. Well, tonight, fans, friends and former players are paying their respects to John and his legacy. We can cross live to Coventry and to our sports correspondent, Steve Clamp. And Steve, it's a huge loss. And of course, many people tonight remembering a man who really did cement the club's place in footballing history. Yes, he was very much the mastermind behind that remarkable day in 1987 where this club made history, a day that hasn't been repeated since. And I suppose it wasn't just about what he did for Coventry City, but because by beating Tottenham in a game where they were massive underdogs, he sent out a, a signal to all the teams, all the, all the fans around the country that the what seems like the impossible is possible. It was a quite remarkable achievement. He was also a successful Hereford manager, of course, but it's certainly here in Coventry where he is most fondly remembered for that uh, FA Cup victory. And uh, I, I met him several times over the years and I've been taking a look back on a remarkable man. Look at that. What a picture. It's taken 104 years to do it. Coventry City's finest hour. FA Cup winners against a Tottenham side full of superstars. What's happened with your pal? He's too tired. He's like a Tottenham player down there. Come a few years ago, John Sillett told me, despite their underdog status, he had never doubted they would win. I knew they would fight, and I knew they could play, and I knew they were as fit as any team that's ever walked out on my mind. And uh, that's why I thought, right, just sit back and enjoy it. It's a lovely, lovely day, sunny day. Let's play football. And I always preach that if there's good grass, keep the ball on it. He's got the cross in. Hand on my heart. I believed we were going to win that cup. Put in again towards Houchin, a flick on by him, and a chance for Bennett. And it's 1 1. Goff is in there, Mabbitt is in there. And Spurs are back in the lead. And to see that ball go in the net, and I turned to George and I said, George, get the whiskey out quick. I said, I think I need a drink. A very, very good FA Cup final. And Hatchin! There, we're extra time, and we all get round. I call them over, and then I think I gave the best Churchillian speech I've ever given in my life. I made them look at the Tottenham boys. I said, look at them, they are shattered. They have gone. Look at our dealies, his legs have gone. Look at Hoddle. Can't get a kick from Lloyd McGrath. I said, boys, just look at them. And there we get up gently and run on the spot and just show them that we're ready. And I had them running on the spot there. And I saw the Tottenham boys sort of look across and say, what are they doing? But I think little things like that work. Pickering waiting in the middle. And another end goal. The memories of that great day and the celebrations that followed would carry on to this day. But John's reign in charge ended in 1990. His love for the club, though, never faded. Just last year, he told us one of the reasons he thinks it is so very special. I think they've got the best fans in the country. They travel away, they, you don't hear them booing. They don't ever boo the side. They always try to pick them up. And this coming from a man born and raised in Southampton. He also had a successful spell in charge of Hereford, 
But in the end, there was never any question which club and which city was in John's heart. I've got nothing but thanks to the club for the way they've looked after me and for the way they're playing. It's giving pride back into Coventry and I've got a lot of pride for Coventry. I'm Coventry through and through. And Steve, just amazing to see those pictures again and just to hear in his own words, John, remember that day and, and what an incredible day it was as well. And no shortage of people who were there with him lining up to pay tribute today, I would imagine, too. Absolutely. I mean, great memories, great to go back through all that. And out that we're here in the shadow of Jimmy Hill's statue because it was Jimmy Hill who first brought John Sillett to Coventry, signing him as a player many, many years ago. Speaking of players, let's speak to two of those who were key men in 1987. Dave Bennett, first of all, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. A, a huge loss. Yeah, massive loss today. He was a colossal of a man. As you just said, uh, Jimmy Hill signed him. We've lost uh, three colossal people. Sir Regis and George Curtis but John Sillett was the man who was the manager who put together a wonderful wonderful set of players uh, with spirit uh, and camaraderie and uh, that's shown through and uh, knowing him as a friend manager and now it's just a sad day for Coventry City. Just briefly, your thoughts when you look back on 1987, obviously a day of huge celebration, a remarkable day. Yeah, yeah great day in more ways than one. Obviously, you, you get to your first cup final with Coventry City and you think, have we got a chance? And it, 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 they always said that we were underdogs. Well, we, we always had a, a chance that because it's a cup final. So it's a two-dog race, you know, it's up to who, who, who wants it today. But it's the way we won it, how we won it. And the, the, the old lead up towards it, and uh, John Sillett with George Curtis, obviously uh, being a good, good cop, bad cop, <laughs> uh, as they say, uh, masterminded Amazing. it. Amazing, and to lose George just a few months ago as well. Yeah. That the, the, the pair were, were obviously superb. Trevor, again, thank you for joining us no tonight. Problem. My question to you is: you, you had such a tough run in that year '87. People remember the final because it was yeah. tough against Tottenham, but you beat Man United, you beat Leeds on the way there, Sheffield Wednesday. What did John do that got you past those teams and then got you to win a final? He was very emotional sometimes in the dressing room before a game. Uh, when we were at Sheffield Wednesday for the semi-final, he. Was, we, we all came off the pitch and he was there sort of revving us up, if you like. Uh, and he, he could make people work harder than other people. So it was in the passion, it was in the way he spoke to you, charged you up? Definitely, definitely. He's got a real voice that, that he could carry through. And he could be, a, like Dave said, a good cop and a bad cop <laughs> uh, to, to different people. And, but he could really motivate people, which well, is a great thing to have. Thank you for both joining us. On, obviously, it's an emotional day, so I really appreciate you coming out and seeing us tonight. Thank you both thank very you. much indeed. Uh, the players there. And we'll be hearing a bit about how the fans are feeling later in the programme. OK, Steve, for the time being, uh, thank you very much. Great to hear those tributes. And as Steve said, we will have more a little later in the programme, including a great story from a man we spoke to today uh, about how he borrowed some boots uh, from John's house. More on that a little bit later on. Now, though, let's get some other news. And an 18-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder after another man was stabbed in Erdington. A 25-year-old was found with serious injuries in Chudley Road at around 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon. A mother from Birmingham says she's facing an earn-or-learn dilemma for her family over upcoming universal credit changes. Mana Davis worries that her daughter, who has Down syndrome, might not be able to go into further education. Well, next month, it will be harder for those with learning disabilities to be able to claim if they're in education. The government says universal credit isn't intended to duplicate other funding that's on offer. Lewis Warner reports. From playing the piano to studying spellings. 18-year-old Keris loves to learn. She has Down syndrome and was looking forward to continuing her education at a life skills college in Harborne. But now her mother fears that might not happen. From next month, it will become harder to claim universal credit if you're in education. Vital funding the family can't do without. It's a choice between us stuck at home doing nothing or going on to college to learn about life skills. So it's pretty, you know, 
it's not a fair choice to anyone. I think it's very unfair. The Department for Work and Pensions have introduced new regulations which will prevent students from getting universal credit even if they are able to show they have a limited capability for work. These new regulations mean that from the 15th of December onwards, a claim for universal credit made by someone who is in education will be refused unless they had already established a limited capability for work before they started receiving education. How do you feel knowing that she might not now be able to go on to further education because you effectively can't do without this money? I'm just so upset for her. It's like... You know, basically for the past two, three years, we've got a prepared, so I'm like, you're going on to college when you leave school. So to actually take that away from her and say, like, actually, I can't do it. I mean, I feel guilty, the fact that I can't afford it, because my daughter's always come first as a single parent. We do fear that, you know, preventing disabled students from accessing universal credit may mean that some Families and some students feel that education is not really a practical option or a sustainable, feasible option for them moving forward. The DWP says our student support system includes the student loan and the disabled students allowance, as well as discretionary bursaries, grants and hardship funds. Universal credit isn't intended to duplicate this. Personal independence payments and disability living allowance are also available to help disabled students with the extra costs of living with a disability or health condition. But this change will leave many families with a choice to earn or learn. Lewis Warner, ITV News. Northfield, Birmingham. A health expert says some families in the Midlands are facing a postcode lottery when it comes to child health care visitors. ITV News has been given exclusive access to a national survey of health visitors. Well, one told us she fears there could be another case like Baby P, a young boy who died after being abused at home. The government says it's investing millions to improve support for families. But is it enough? Lauren Hall reports. A friendly face on the doorstep. Hi, Hi Charlotte. Hello, Ethan. It's made a big difference to Charlotte Davies, who's had a lot of support from her health visiting team since having her young son. Having that face-to-face -face where someone's really supportive, able to give lots of information to you and just reassure you that you're doing OK. Health visitors are such a valuable resource. Working with every family from antenatal period right the way through till school entry, offering support to parents when they really need it. Health visitors are able to help in all sorts of ways, from offering guidance with breastfeeding to picking up on any health or development issues. They also support the most vulnerable to help keep children safe. The idea is that they're there for everyone, but here in the Midlands, some families are missing out. So health visitors in the Midlands are facing challenges like they are in the rest of England. We've got a national workforce shortage of about 5,000 health visitors in England. And it's a bit of a postcode lottery because it's not affecting areas equally. So in some parts of the Midlands, health visitors are able to give families a good level of support. And in other parts of the area, they're getting virtually nothing. A survey of health visitors shared exclusively with us highlights some of the challenges they're facing across the UK. Over a quarter have caseloads of more than 750 children. That's three times the recommended amount. The majority say they're increasingly needed to help with things like behaviour, communication and mental health, as well as safeguarding and domestic abuse. 39% of health visitors report being so stretched they fear there may be a tragedy. And 42%, nearly half, worry they can't do enough to safeguard babies and children. One health visitor we spoke to, who doesn't want to be identified, says it's down to a lack of resources and that the pandemic's made a bad situation even worse. That burden and that feeling of, oh my God, something's going to go wrong and some harm's going to be caused. We're going to have a high profile case like Baby P and that keeps you awake at night. You feel that lives are being put at risk? Well, children will be harmed as a result, if not in the sense of physical harm, sexual harm, but harmed in that they're not going to be school ready, they've not got the development and speech and language that they need, they're not toilet trained, those are still harms too. A sentiment shared by hundreds of children's charities and organisations who are calling for more investment in health visiting. 
think this is a concern for wider society as a large. If we're missing these vital interactions for health visitors to be able to go and see and assess what's really going on on the ground, then there are going to be negative implications for families and, and, and children. The government told us they're investing millions to improve support for families. They said we're committed to ensuring everyone has the best start in life and health visiting services are crucial to supporting children in the early years. Local authorities and their teams are working hard to reinstate services and the public health grant will continue to ensure investment is made in prevention and frontline services. Despite that, there's still a lot of concern that there simply aren't enough health visitors to be able to support every family and every child. Lauren Hall, ITV News. Well, as we heard in that report, one particular area of concern is the impact on safeguarding. Earlier, I spoke to Dr Peter Green, the chair of the National Network of Designated Healthcare Professionals for Children, and I began by asking him how vital health visitors are. They have three main roles, uh, the first of which is to uh, monitor health and development of uh, babies and infants so that they grow up and hit their developmental milestones appropriately. Secondly, they form positive and relationships with young parents to enable them to work alongside them when they're dealing with problems such as domestic abuse or dealing with child obesity. And third, but by no, by no means least, they also help parents develop their own positive relationships with their babies and young infants. So a vital role, and obviously a lot of it is about support. So what concerns you the most about the challenges that are facing the health visiting profession? Well, COVID has exposed um, children and families to a vast number of increased risks. Uh, domestic abuse has increased, obesity has increased. We've got children and families who are struggling with mental health problems, both from postnatal depression to children's behaviour. Are there enough health visitors at the moment, Dr. Wynne? Because obviously they've been affected in much the same way as we all have by COVID. There aren't enough health visitors. There aren't enough who are providing appropriate support in what is an increasingly complex world for parents to bring up children in. And, and the evidence of the things which are getting worse over the COVID period sustains that. And there's a real importance, I think, in investing now in babies and young children to give them the future which they deserve and which is being damaged um, in prospect by the consequences of COVID. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Dr Peter Green, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Staffordshire-born Olympic swimming champion Adam Peaty is calling on the government to spend more money to help grassroots sport. He was one of three Midlands athletes giving evidence today to MPs looking at the future of the national lottery. While much needed funding comes from the proceeds of the lottery, questions were raised about its links to the gambling industry. You know, at the end of the day, this is funded by gambling. And we know that gambling is funded by the poorest people often in society, in the poorest areas of society. It's a society, it's a society problem, really. Um, and I think Camelot obviously use good causes, use the National Lottery Funding for Sport as a good cause to gamble. And I think that's where it's wrong that, <clears throat> yes, it's great that we get this funding. Yes, it's great that it goes to all these good projects and it builds and protects you know, certain things. But there needs to be more accountability. In a statement, the National Lottery operator Camelot told us the National Lottery is subject to separate legislation and regulation to the wider gambling industry. It's also widely recognised, they say, that the National Lottery is very different from mainstream gambling and that the inherent risk of problem play is, they say, very low. A reminder that the ITV Evening News is on after us with more on the Prime Minister's booster jab rollout. That's at half past six and then later on ITV, it's the latest edition of On Assignment. Here's Raggy Omar. Earlier this month, Israel passed its first budget in more than three years, its first government without Benjamin Netanyahu for more than a decade. But more importantly, the first government in the state's history featuring a self-proclaimed Islamist Arab. With Arabs making up 21% of the population, I travelled to the country to find out what this means for Israel's future. 
Carl Dinan travels to Rome as the Eternal City is declared the sinkhole capital of Europe. And finally, it's coffee harvesting season in China, and Debbie Edward looks to see whether the country's taste for coffee is here to stay. That's on assignment tonight at 10.45. Next, the board, which runs the Commonwealth Games, has been in Birmingham to check up on preparations for next summer's events. Yes, it's just under eight months until the opening ceremony at the Alexander Stadium. Well, this morning, the Commonwealth Games Federation joined the organisers of Birmingham 2022 to review the building work and make sure that the project is on course. We've got a deadline of the opening ceremony and we have to make that deadline. And what I'm seeing at the moment here is really extraordinary and I take my hat off to all the builders and everything what you've gone through with COVID and things like that that to be at this stage now with what we've had in the last two years I think it's second to none it's fantastic. Yeah we are ready to, to host a, a fantastic event an event that I think the whole city and indeed the whole country will be proud of we are really really looking forward to our moment and our chance to shine. Yes, eight months and counting. Now, people in Coventry have been out with their shovels today to help start planting trees in the city over the next 10 years. Yes, 360,000 trees are being planted in green spaces, one for every citizen. City Council teams say they hope it will promote healthy lifestyles, combat climate change and increase biodiversity across the area. Long term, we'll have... Um greater green spaces and it, it should create nice habitats for um, wildlife. It's great, yeah, we've had a really good turnout as, a, as you can see. Um, uh, we put in about 2,000 today um, trees. Uh, they're going as whips at the moment and then hopefully in you know, 20 years time they'll be fully matured uh, trees and this will all be a, a woodland. Well, we're staying in Coventry now and we're returning to our top story, with tributes being paid to the club's FA Cup winning manager, John Sillett. Yes, our sports correspondent Steve Clamp is outside the stadium for us this evening. Steve, earlier we heard at length from former players. What about the fans? Of course, it's a devastating day for the fans. This man meant so much to them. He was a legend, a word that does get used a lot, but in this case, certainly appropriate. And I'm joined by Sarah Morris and Billy Bell, both very much involved with the Coventry Former Players Association. Sarah, why do you think he had such a bond with the fans? Well, he was, he was just such a wonderful man, um, always made time for everybody. And whenever you spoke to him, you always came away feeling special. And Billy, what, what did he mean to you? Uh, such a lot, not just for Coventry City, but the city of Coventry. He gave us one of the greatest days in our history, not just for the football club, but for the city of Coventry, when they won the FA Cup, when it was such a, a special event in those days, Steve. Fantastic guy. And, and I, uh, I yeah. think it would be fair for me to say, Sarah, he never had any side to him, never any ego. I mean, he would just stop and talk no. to people. He always gave us his time if we asked him to. Yeah, he, he was great. He was just so generous um, and had a great sense of humour as well, which it was, it was great. It shone through with him. And, of course, you uh, I spent a lot of time dealing with the former players. And, of course, this has been a tough day because you've had to ring round and, and break the news to many of them. Yes, it was so announced so early this morning, Steve. But, yes, it's one of the things we have to do. And it's so sad doing the job. But the good news is today's a sad day and we'll all be sad, naturally. But when we have our Legends Day and hopefully in April of next year, we will have it as a tribute day to George Curtis and John Sillett, George and John Day. So all the fans can come along that day and celebrate the life of two great guys. Of course, we've not talked a lot about George today, but he only died a few months ago and the two Absolutely. of them together were the ones who led this team to that cup glory. So it's sad that they've both passed uh, so close together, but at least you will be able to mark and remember them in a few months' time. It will be amazing because it's the 35th anniversary of us winning the FA Cup and we had sort of pre-arranged that the team would get back together and they're still all coming, which is wonderful. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. And I know it is a very upsetting day for all the fans. And, and in fact, it was nice because you may remember the story we just saw about the tree planting in Coventry. Well, uh, one of the rangers there had his own little story that he wanted to share about John Sillett. Met John Sillett a few years ago um, to get a pair of boots from him that went into a sculpture in Belgrade Plaza and it was against racism and he was very accommodating when he'd done that. And, you know, think back to what he'd done for the city as well. You know, put Coventry on the map. And that was a day I always remember when we won. 
And Steve, a great trip down memory lane today. We heard about the Legends Day there planned for next April. Uh, any other word from the club today and what they're going to do uh, to Mark John's passing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they're going to have a minute's applause ahead of the West Brom game. They've also released a statement today. This came from Mark Robbins, the manager. John was and will remain a great inspiration to me and to many others, and no doubt for those who will have the honour of managing the club in the future. He was a top guy. He was full of support and full of wisdom, and he will be sadly missed by not only myself, but everyone at Coventry City Football Club. Our thoughts and condolences go to Gene and the family. And I certainly echo that last part. Uh, Gene always made us feel very welcome, as did John, whenever we went round to see him. Um, I mentioned they'll have a minute's applause here. Hereford, of course, another club who he managed at, are having a minute's silence ahead of their game tonight. OK, Steve, for the time being, uh, thank you very much indeed. Yes, you're not the first person to mention the hospitality whenever anyone went to interview John. Several cups of tea are usually what followed when you sat down to chat to him, <laughs> which is great news. Right, it is time now to get the weather. Des is here, and Des, what can I say, it was Narnia yesterday. It's spring-like today. You're absolutely right, and it's going to get even chillier once we get on to Thursday. You'll have to wait for the weather forecast. But remember, it is the end of November, 30 days in September, April, June and November, of course. Tomorrow is the beginning of what I call the magical month. You know why? It's December, the beginning of December. And what happens in December? It's my birthday. Is it? <laughs> it is. She said that because she wants a present from us. You realise that? <laughs> I do realise that, yes. <laughs> obviously. Yeah. It's me and uh, another quite I'll have to think day. what I'm going to get you now, actually. But anyway, <laughs> let's find out what's happening when it comes to our weather. Why not just after this? Making the most of it, whatever the weather. Octopus Energy sponsors ITV Central Weather. Yes, well, it is Tuesday, the 30th of November, and our day hasn't been too bad. Weather-wise, temperature-wise, I should say, we really are seeing a roller coaster ride uh, as we head Wednesday night into Thursday. Thursday, in particular, things really are turning uh, fairly cold. Great picture sent in by Andrew from Wensbury. Wensbury is one of the few towns in England, actually, that was named after a pre-Christian uh, deity. And this next picture has been sent in by Liza. Now, weather story, Wednesday into Thursday. We've got high pressure towards the south, low pressure towards the north. Squeeze on the ice bars and this system feeding through there. The reason I mention that is because it's a similar setup to what gave us all that snow a few days ago. We haven't got a weather warning issued as of yet, but like I say, it's a bit of a heads up. So on to the weather story for tonight. We've got a fair amount of rain pushing through, leaving a lot of spray on the roads. It moves through fairly quickly. Behind that, isolated showers, temperatures dipping down to around six degrees. The sky start to clear, which means when we wake up tomorrow morning, sun sunshine and showers because the sun is low in the sky you should see a rainbow or two having said that by the time we get into the afternoon i think those showers really are going to intensify and we see the winds coming down from the north so it's going to feel cold temperatures averaging out at around six degrees but with the strength of breeze pushing through at 35 miles an hour it's going to feel more like two now I'm going to take you all the way towards uh, Sweden because we saw minus 22 Sunday morning. By the time we got to Monday morning, all the way down there in Greece, temperatures had climbed to around 13 degrees. That is chilly, minus 22. We're not going to get any temperatures nearer that. Um, I'm going to leave you with the summary, though. Enjoy. Octopus Energy sponsors ITV Central Weather. And that's pretty much it from us for this evening. We're going to end, though, this evening with the words of one family who left a tribute in Coventry uh, tonight to John Sillett, of course, as the city remembers its greatest uh, manager. It reads, if we can have a look, thank you, Snoz, uh, the man with a heart as big as the sky blue city that loved him so much. Fans from all kinds of clubs today across all the leagues remembering John Sillett, who has died at the age of 85. And that is it from us for this evening. The ITV Evening News is next and I'm back with the Late Bulletin a little later on. From all the team, though, enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Bye-bye.